yourself who are you Lord where are you reveal yourself to me that I may know who you are that I may know what to prefer and I may change my character and stop doing what you don't want everyone deceives his neighbor and no one speaks the truth verse 5 says they have taught their tongue to speak lies they commit iniquity and are too weary to repent this is Lent Many Christians refuse to observe this land because of stupid arguments that, you see, uh, 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 um, uh, Jesus didn't die at this time. Uh, you, you, you do not know. In, in fact, we don't have to do it this time. We can fast any, any other time. That's an unnecessary rebellion against what the Christian world decided they would do to commemorate the 40 days of fasting of Jesus and his passion. What's bad in that? They speak against Christmas, they speak against Lent, they speak against every single thing because they do not know God. And yet the same people on the day of their national day, independence, they celebrate. On the day of their individual birthdays, they celebrate. On the day of their wedding uh, anniversary, they, they celebrate. Not even their own, other people's own. But when it comes to Christ, it's argument because they do not know God. My job is to explain all these things to you and not to be patting you at the back because God himself said in verse 12, verse 12 of the same Jeremiah 9, he said, who is the man so wise that he can understand this? Who is the man so wise that he can understand this? To whom has the mouth of the Lord spoken that he may declare it? He has spoken to me. That's why I'm declaring it. He has granted me a little bit of the mysteries of his kingdom. That's why I'm standing up separately to declare these things that many refuse to declare. Why? Verse 12 continues. Why is the land ruined and laid waste like a wilderness so that no one passes through? Why? Why? Just why? The church is desolate. Let's stop deceiving ourselves. The church is desolate. It doesn't matter if you have thousands of, it, of people in your church. How many of them will get to heaven? Why will you not have thousands of people in your church when you are doing business in your church? I received a leaflet today about mission to London. And there were some other leaflets put in it. Asking churches or businesses to come and um, buy slots at the mission to London for exhibition of their businesses and their churches. And they'll be charging 700 pounds minimum for each one. It made my heart sick. If Jesus comes into that place, he will take a cane, he will flog all of them out like he did before because my house is the house of prayer and not a business center. It's not a place of buying and selling. I'm completely surprised that the organizers of that mission could think about bringing business and making money into it. And many churches do it when they have their big, big conventions. They bring businesses in that will be selling their businesses and buying there. So it's a business center. 
The church has become a business center. It is desolate. I will not be a part of it. I will not be a part of it. If it is five people I can take to the kingdom of God, so let it be. The land is ruined. God is saying, why is the land ruined and laid waste like a wilderness so that no one passes through? And the Lord gave the answer himself in verse 13. The Lord says, because they have forsaken my law which I said before them. They have forsaken my law. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, not a den of robbers. That's why the churches today are also slowly and many on the fast track embracing homosexual marriages and some other terrible things like witchcraft, adding juju to worship, occultic forces, mixing it. Dressing in unseemly fashion. That's why the governments of this world are now taxing churches. Before, churches did not use to pay taxes. But now, churches are paying taxes because some churches are richer than some banks. So why should they not pay tax? The land is desolate. It's ruined. People are ruining the body of Christ. And God said, because they have forsaken my law, which I said before them, I have not obeyed my voice or walk in accord with it. Walk in accord with it. What I'm trying to do is to bring people back to the ancient path where the good way, where the good way is, that they might walk in it. And I thank God that many people are blessed by that. I will not join the Broadway. I will seek and walk the narrow way. I will not join the Broadway. And if no one joins me, still I will follow the narrow way. I'm not a perfect man. I'm a sinful man. But I will still walk that narrow way. Paul was not a perfect man. He was a sinful man. Peter cried bitterly. I'm a sinful man, he said. But he walked the narrow way. So will I. And those who will join me, follow me. Verse 14 says, All right, let me read verses 13 and 14 together to make complete sense. And the Lord says, Because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them, and have not obeyed my voice, or walked in accord with it, but, verse 14, have stubbornly followed their own hearts. I have gone after Baals as their fathers taught them. They, fo they, they stubbornly follow their own hearts. When the truth is being preached, does your heart rebel against that truth because you know, you know it's condemning you? Instead of your heart rebelling against it, can't you thank God that he's correcting you and change? Therefore, verse 15, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will feed these people with one wood and give them poisonous water to drink. That is God for you. Do not believe people who say God cannot do you harm. He can do you gr grievous bodily and spiritual harm. That's what he can do to you. That's why I said to you, try everything in your power to avoid what he can do to you. Because it's not funny.
Who are those that he's talking about? All those that we have been discussing since this program began. Everyone who deceives his neighbor, who does not speak the truth. Verse 6, heaping oppression upon oppression, deceit upon deceit, and refuse to know him. Those are the ones he's talking about. Those who forsake the law, the procedure he has put before him, before them, and who serve God in the morning and go to shrines in the evening. God says in verse 7, Therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will refine them and test them. For what test can I do because of my people? You see, what test can I do because of my people? God will defend those who are his people against those who pretend to be his people and are not his people. God says bitterly in verse 8, their tongue is a deadly arrow. It speaks deceitfully. With his mouth, it speaks peaceably with his neighbor, but in his heart, he plans to ambush him. That's a Christian for you. That's a Christian for you. Hello, brother. Oh, praise the Lord for your life. You are blessed. That was a wonderful service. And after us, he will plan to ambush you, to discredit you, to turn the people against you. God says in verse 9, Shall I not punish them for these things? So those of you who are doing it, God is about to punish you. Better stop right now. Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord? And shall I not avenge myself on a nation such as, as this? Verse 15. Says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will feed these people with warm wood and give them poisonous water to drink. That is the story of your life. That's, that's why you are sick. That's why terrible things happen to you. Because contrary to what you believe that it is an enemy that is after you, it is God punishing you because of your deceitful life, because of the, 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 the evil way you use your tongue. The wickedness of your heart. He said, I will scatter them among the nations whom neither they nor their fathers have known. And I will send the sword after them until I have consumed them. Pray that he doesn't do those things to you. And God himself now calls for repentance. He calls for a season of Lent. A season of Lent is a season where you are supposed to, to go on a retreat, to set yourself apart. And weep before the Lord. God is calling for repentance. He said in verse 17, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider and call for mourning women to come. Women who are professional criers. Women who will be eating and suddenly tears will be flowing. Call for them. Send for skillful women to come. Let them make haste and raise a wailing over us that our eyes may run down with tears. In, in other words, let them teach us how to weep before the Lord in deep contrition. I say, have mercy. Forgive us, O Lord. Turn our feet back. Turn our hearts back to you to seek you. And our eyelids gush with water. Verse 19, for a sound of wailing is heard from Zion. How we are ruined. We are utterly shamed because we have left the land, because we have cast down our dwellings. Those are the words that, that should be running in your mind during the time of your repentance. Confession, confession, we are ruined. Don't say you are not ruined when you are ruined. You are ruined. Confess to God, God, I am ruined. I'm utterly shamed because I have left your way. 
I've turned my back on your dwellings. I've turned my back on your, on your house above in heaven. Hear, O oh women, the word of the Lord, and let your ear receive word of his mouth. Teach to your daughters a lament, and each to her neighbor a dirge. That is to say, those of us who are sober and who have learned how to weep like women, we should listen to God in our prayers, in our dreams, and warn our people, teach them to lament. Teach them to come to sober repentance. For verse 21 says, death has come upon our windows. It has entered our palaces. Cutting off the children from the streets and the young men from the squares. Is that not the case? Death and sickness has entered the body of Christ, the house of God. A lot of people are dying of diseases they should not die for. Years ago, when medical practice was not as this, God was healing a lot of people in the churches. Many, many terrible sicknesses were brought to Christ Apostolic Church in those days, and God healed them. But today, members of Christ Apostolic Church and others, other churches are dying, even of headache, are dying of stomach problems, are dying in childbirth. It should not be. Many people in churches are losing their children, being kidnapped or motor accident or whatever. Or dying of fever or pneumonia, jaundice, malaria, arrow of the enemy. It should not be. Death has come into our windows. It has scattered, it has entered our churches. Cutting off our children, even our children who don't die. The devil throws them out of the church. They rebel against us. They leave the church and join clubs. God says in verse 22, Speak. God says the Lord. The dead bodies of men shall fall like dung upon the open field, like sheep after the reaper, and none shall gather them. May God have mercy on us. Verse 23. God says, Let not the wise man glory in, in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But, verse 24, Let him who glories glory in this. In what? that he understands and know me. That must be our glory. Not in, not in how much money we have. Oh, praise the Lord. The Lord has blessed me. I have one contract, millions of dollars or whatever. That's no glory. That's shame. You don't know the Lord. You don't know the mind of the Lord. That is why you think that it is, it is money that is the only blessing God, God, God can give you. Money, money, money is not blessing from the Lord. That's an automatic thing. Money is not blessing from the Lord. There are deeper, deeper, deeper blessings. The grace to understand him, the grace to know him. He's saying that must be your glory. Verse 24, but let him who, but let him who glories, glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practiced steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, says the Lord. So who is God? He is the Lord who practiced steadfast love. That's why he weeps and agonizes over us. He is the Lord who practices justice. He will not support you because you want him to support you. He will, he will support you if you are right. He will go against you if you are wrong. Know this about him. 
Stop asking God to kill those who think are your enemies. He will not kill them because he knows that you are the one wronging them. Not they wronging you. You are the one causing it. And you are looking for sympathy all over the whole place. He's a God of justice. He will not take your side because you are a Christian and the other one is a Muslim. He will not back you foolishly. You borrow money from somebody and you are not paid back and you are running away from him and he tracks you down and he shouts at you, give me my money. And you go to church and start praying and asking the pastors to pray that God should deal with him. He's your enemy. God will destroy him and kill him dead. It's you he will kill dead. Not him. Because you are the wrong one. Who is God? He's a God of justice. It's a God who loves you and loves the other man. It's a God who is righteous. And who delights in righteousness in the earth. He wants righteousness in the earth. He doesn't care about business enterprise. He wants righteousness in the earth. He wants his kingdom to permit the whole earth. For in these things I delight, says the Lord. Behold, verse 25, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will punish all those who are circumcised, but yet uncircumcised. Egypt, Judah, Edom, sons of Ammon, Moab, and all who dwell in the desert that cut the corners of their hair. For all these nations are uncircumcised. And all the house of Israel is uncircumcised in heart. That is the clue. What does it mean by, I will punish all those who are circumcised but yet uncircumcised? It means he will punish those churches who say they are born again and yet not born again at all. Nothing new about them. And he gave a list. Egypt, Judah, Edom, sons of Amon, Moab. Today he will not mention Egypt. He will be mentioning de denominations. The name of different denominations which I will not mention. I hope to God that my denomination, Christ Apostolic Church, will not be one of those that he considers to be circumcised and yet uncircumcised. That's why I'm crying to my members day and night. Some of them don't find it funny, but I will continue to push it down their truth. That they have to be circumcised in heart. And so do you, and so must you. Because God says, and all the house of Israel is uncircumcised in heart. If you follow that, that means that God is saying to us that all the churches in the world today are uncircumcised in heart. And that is a great indictment that we must take seriously. And we should take it seriously if we have come to know him. And what he says he means. And he can do us Terrible harm. He can give us poisonous water to drink. He can give us warm wood to eat. He can punish us in so many ways at one. And many are being punished al already. Untimely death is rampant in the churches. Different sicknesses. People being hospitalized, operation this way, operation that way. We people in the church, our members and we the leaders, many times we are rushed to A and E. Why should that be? If you are right with God, even if we fall sick, one cry to him, he should touch us and heal us. But because there is wickedness in our midst, because we claim to be circumcised while we are not circumcised,
we are in danger of being punished perpetually by him. And the only remedy is to weep. If you don't know how to weep, consult women who are professionals at weeping. They will teach you how to weep. In deep contrition, repentance. Yeah.